Lord God, words are not enough to express your awesomeness, your majesty, your holiness. Our highest expressions of theology are but baby talk next to you, your creation, your very self. You make us aware, Lord, through your Holy Spirit that you are here among us now. May this awareness lead us to approach this hour more carefully. The words that we speak, the songs that we sing, the thoughts we think, the joy and the sadness that we feel, may these be pleasing to you. For in spite of the inadequacy of our words, Lord, this worship is addressed to you. So make it complete and whole, full to overflowing, O God, our rock and our redeemer. In Christ we pray, amen.
Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of the worthy Lamb, Jesus our Lord. We are so blessed because you loved us and you sent Jesus to be our sacrificial lamb even while we were still sinners. Lord, we echo the lofty words of Ephesians 1. You have blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for redeeming us through your blood. Thank you for the riches of your grace that you have lavished on us. What an amazing, powerful, wise God you are. We praise you right now. Thank you, Almighty God, for being our refuge and strength. There is so little security or certainty in this world. So we come to you as our rock of stability and support. You know our circumstances, Lord, as we face frightening events and evil people and physical weakness and sadness that can be almost unbearable. Lord, as we look to you, take away our fear, our loneliness, even as the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, whatever storms we face, we keep our eyes on you. Thank you for being our eternal refuge. And Lord, as you lead us into green pastures and into paths of righteousness for your name's sake, make us strong and courageous so that like Joshua of old, we can accomplish your calling in our lives now as champions for anyone who's in pain or in poverty. Lord, help us to be champions as agents of compassion and truth and beauty as initiators of the positive values that your word declares are important. May the work of Jesus move forward. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, guide our thoughts and words and actions today. Let our hearts be filled with your praise. Let us never forget the things you do for us. Renew our strength and refresh our souls. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.
is our living hope. We're glad about that and we worship him today. Welcome again to our service here online at Fairhaven Church. We greet you in Jesus name and if you're relatively new we'd ask you to get better acquainted by texting the word Fairhaven to 97,000. It's a great way to get connected with us to share a prayer request and to take a next step of some kind in your spiritual journey. And also take a look at today's online bulletin. You can find sermon notes and some upcoming events. And you can scan the code that you see. Or you can find our online bulletin in our church app. Today we have a couple of videos to share with you by way of information. First, our lead pastor David Smith has come with a very important update for us right now. Classics, it's so great to be with you today by way of video. I want to greet those of you that are online and those of you that are right here in person in our Centerville campus. The Classic Service has been a great venue for us and we're so glad that you have come back and it's amazing to be able to see each other's faces. The power of community and building deep relationships is something that we value highly here at Fairhaven Church. And so thank you for trusting us as we were in a COVID season and trying to do the right thing. And now that uh, the governor has lowered the mask mandate and we've stated that we want you to make your own personal health decisions. So I wanna let you know of a change that we're going to need to make because we wanna put all of our energies in the in-person classic service. We're going to stop the online classic service the beginning of July. So if you're online with us, um, we would invite you to come in person to join the rest of us as we feel that the power of community is so evident. You know, it's amazing when you see a person smile, how that can change your day. A conversation or a word of affirmation can really give you courage and encouragement for the rest of the week. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you for inviting your friends and coworkers and neighbors as we have a desire to start a second in-person classic service. We are so grateful in what God has done in our church family. And thank you for being a part of that. I look forward to seeing you very soon. So the last Classics online service will be on June 27. Then we invite you to attend Classics in person here live. Or you can join the online campus to participate then in the modern online service. 
Now, during this season of transition, as we come out of the pandemic time and uh, get back to normal, as we're hoping, uh, we do have some other things that we'd like to share with you. One is to be thankful for all of our serve team members who have made it possible during this time for us to welcome more and more people back to live worship services. We've had guest services, volunteers, and people who are with us and helping with kids' ministry, production. So all of those times when serve team members have made all the difference, we want to say thank you so much for getting us through this time. Today, we want to introduce to you just one of these serve team members, so watch this video. My name is Jay Cavendish. I've been attending services with my family at, at the, uh, with Fairhaven since January of 2000. When we moved down to the Springboro campus and opened at the school in 2014, we were part of the initial group of folks who moved down here, and I've been involved with the guest services team since that time. My grandfather was good friends with the head usher at our church when I was growing up, and I got so, uh, I, I so enjoyed watching them greet people. And so one time I got the opportunity to fill in. I was like 10 years old, and it was just a thrill for me to be able to open the door for people and say welcome and smile and make them feel at home when they came to visit our church. I remember back to when we were first looking for a church when we arrived here in 99 and we went to several churches and I never felt the emotional connection with the church until we went to Fairhaven. And the first time we went to Fairhaven, we said, this is it, we're home, we know this and we've never been to another church since. And I want people to know that same feeling, that when they come in here, they've made the connection with a family uh, in a church that cares about them. From my perspective, I see the role of being a guest services team member as being a, a door opener. It gives an individual the opportunity to get involved in ministry, um, where they can meet other people, they can, they can help other people find their way when they first come here. And it, it's, it's really the initial step towards a ministerial role here at the church. The best way to, for me to see God at work is to see a reflection of individuals who have had some very hard times. And those that we've had, to, we've had the opportunity to spend time with, to pray with, to help them move forward in finding the hope that they can find here and, and to see them then become vibrant members of our community and want to be a part of our team or another team here. And just to, to see that is so rewarding. Uh, we, we can see that we're making an impact here. We're so thankful for Jay and for everyone on all of our serve teams, on all of our campuses that make our Sunday mornings so awesome. Now, if you're not on a serve team, and perhaps you would consider doing that here, uh, you might want that as one of your next right steps in your journey. Being part of a serve team will help you to connect with other people and experience deeper meaning in your walk with God and walk with these people here at church. And it really gives legs and life to your relationship with God as you serve the church of Jesus Christ. We'd like to talk to you about opportunities and finding the right way to, for you to serve. So visit our website if you would and find opportunities or just call the church and we'll chat with you about that. Now this week, uh, we start a brand new sermon series called Lowercase G. And we're excited to hear more about this from our Northmont campus pastor, Doug Carroll. So it was just a little over 27 years ago that my brother called me one day and he said, hey, how would you like to go on a missions trip 
with me and some of the guys from Asbury Seminary. So some of the students were gonna be going to Argentina. And I thought, man, this is, this is gonna be great. I'd love to go to Argentina, do some ministry, hang out with you guys a little bit, just take a break. So we decided we were gonna head out and we went down to Miami, Florida because we were gonna fly out from Miami. And as we got ready to fly out for the trip, we noticed that in Miami, in the airport, if you've ever been there, that all the announcements first are in Spanish, then second in English. And we thought, oh wow, you know, we need to like brush up on our Spanish, which we knew zero of, okay? So we decided on the airplane we should learn Spanish because we're heading down to South America and Argentina. So we get on the plane and we start talking a little bit. And we're like, okay, so what should we know? And we should ask where the bathroom is. We had to understand how to ask where the bathroom is. You know, if we wanted some water, we had to ask where, you know, how do we get some water? And then we, we started talking through and looking at some different Spanish things. And we're like, hey, you know, this is a great phrase right here. We need to know this one. Como se llama? And people said, no, 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 it's como se llama. And we're like, no, 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 it's como se llama. We're going to Argentina. We want to ask how their llama is doing because we heard there's probably llamas down there. And that's the same reaction we got from people on the plane, the people from South America. They were laughing at us the whole time. And so we, we just kind of talked about all these things and we flew over there and we had these great expectations about what God was going to do when we got over there. And so as we flew over the Andes Mountains, have you guys ever seen the Andes? There was a movie made called Alive where an airplane crashed and people survived and people actually had to eat other people to stay alive. So we just started deciding who are we going to eat first if we crash here? which was not a good conversation. Most people around us were a little weirded out by that. But anyhow, so we got there and finally we landed. And once we landed, we had a lot of different trips to take. We had to get on several buses and cross over some borders and they would take all of our luggage off the bus and we had to put all the luggage back on the bus after they went through everything. And then sometimes they just bring automatic weapons with dogs and they'd go through and sniff through the aisles and then let us go. So it was a long, long, long journey. So by the time we got to where we were going, we, we got in these taxi cabs, and the great thing was in these taxi cabs, they were 1964 Ford Falcons, okay? And this thing looked like it was brand new. I couldn't believe it. I'm looking at this, and I'm like, this, this thing is immaculate. And so as I was looking at it, we come to find out that Buenos Aires had bought the rights from Ford to rebuild these Ford Falcons. And so they were making them brand new right there. And they were buying them and using them. So that's why they were so immaculate. It was amazing. So we're in this little 64 Ford Falcon. There's five of us crammed in there. And we are cruising through the city. And so we're driving down. There's an intersection coming up. And I don't know if you've ever, uh, if you've ever gone to an intersection. You look to the right or to the left and you see another car coming. And it seems like they're not slowing down, right? And you ever get a little nervous thinking, okay, you know, man, we better slow down because this guy doesn't look like he's slowing down. So I'm looking over at the driver and I look at the speedometer. He's not slowing down. He's actually speeding up. And I'm like, what is he doing? And this guy keeps coming. And I'm like, what is going to happen? So we go and we fly through this intersection. And out of the corner of my eye, I see the other guy fly right behind us. Nobody stopped, nobody yielded, they just kept on going. Now this happened like at three other intersections. And by the time we're getting through this, I'm getting a little nervous going, man, what is happening? So we get to the missionary's house and the missionary is like, yeah, well, um, here's the deal. There's a, there's a few things missing here that you would have in the United States. And I'm like, like what? And he said, well, here's a few of the things. He said, number one, you'll never see one of those. I'm like, okay. He said, here's another sign you won't see out. He said, it's just kind of like, good luck. And he said, and here's the real sign that you missed the whole time. There is no speed limit. I'm like, oh, you're kidding me. He's like, no. And not only that, there are no stop signs. And he said, and believe this or not, it's anywhere you want to go. And so I'm starting to sit here thinking, going, are you kidding me? There's no signs? And he's like, nope. He said, it's first come, first serve. He said, so you yield or you don't yield? He said, you make that decision. He said, and that's what your taxi cab driver was doing. And then there's a few other signs I saw that we don't see much of. Have you ever seen one of these signs? I'd turn back if I was you. I thought that was interesting. I'd love to know where that sign is. And there's another one, sudden gunfire. Not quite sure where that pops up. And then this is my favorite one. This is the new state sign in Ohio when we have all these beautiful bugs that we have now. <laughs> exactly. 
That's our new state sign that's coming out. Next time the cicadas come, we're going to be putting those out all over the road. Beware, beware. But anyhow, so we went through this. It was really interesting to me because I started thinking about how in the United States we have all these signs and they allow us to have harmony on the highway, right? And that harmony on the highway is important for all of us because we all know where we're going. We all know which way we should be going. We all know how fast we should be doing it. Now, sometimes there's a few people who just kind of have some road rage or some other things, you know, and they break those laws and the harmony is, you know, broken because somebody's doing 90 down there and going the wrong way on a ramp or something happens and it causes disharmony. But for the most part, we have these guides to know how we're supposed to interact with one another on the road so we can all get to where we're going, so we can all safely arrive to the places that we want to arrive to. But not there. Everything was just kind of thrown up in the air. So this is kind of the same way in our life. When you think about this, we have to have guides to know how to live, don't we? And so God wanted to make sure we understood that too. So in 1 John 4, 19, he says this, We love because he first loved us. So God loved us first and desires for us to love him back. So we have to figure out what does that look like? How do do we love God back? And God gives us these signs just like we saw on this road, right? He tells us how we can do these different things with him. He's like, we need to understand how this is gonna all work. So when God was serious, he came to humanity And he established the Israelites. And when he established the Israelites, he gave them these 10 directives, these 10 commandments. And it said, hey, look, this this is how you can love me back. This is how we're going to live in relationship. Through these 10 commandments, you're going to understand how to live with me and how to love me. And that's an important thing for us to understand. We need to know that. But then there's this other part. See, we're, we are created to worship God. Do you realize that? I mean, the purpose that we were created for is to worship God because he is so worthy of worship and praise. I know that's hard to get your head around, but that is our purpose. But the problem with you and I, and especially me, I can't talk for you, is that sometimes these other gods get in the way, these little lowercase g gods that help shape our priorities. They start to influence our morality. They start to influence the decisions that we make. They start to influence our whole entire life. And what they do is that these lowercase g gods will take us away and destroy our relationship with the one true God. So we're gonna be talking this summer through a 10-week series in the Ten Commandments. And in this this Ten Commandments, we're going to see how we love God back, the guide that he gave us to be with him and to have life with him. And then we're going to discover in each one of the Ten Commandments, one of the lowercase g gods that faces us to try to take us away from that relationship with God. Now, all of this starts in Exodus 20, 1 through 21, because this is where the Ten Commandments are, okay? So if I started in Exodus 20... I mean, if I started in Exodus 21 through 21, we'd read through all of them, and it would just feel like a bunch of rules and laws that we have to follow to obtain morality or obtain God's grace in our life, right? It would just feel like a bunch of laws. So what we need to do is we're going to take a step back, okay? We need to take a step back because there's a lot of story time in between Genesis, where the Israelites are being established, an exodus to where we get to the Ten Commandments. And in fact, there's so much time, there's actually 440 years between Genesis and Exodus. That is a lot of time, isn't it? It's a lot of time. So we're gonna talk about the backstory of how we got to this place in the Ten Commandments because it's important for us to understand. So we're gonna go back. How many people remember Abraham? Remember this? Anybody ever remember the song in Sunday school? Father Abraham had many sons. Come on, sing. And many sons had Father Abraham. There you go, right, exactly. So that's exactly where it started. He had many sons, and I see people know the motions, I love that, you know. And he had many sons, and a couple of his sons, he had Isaac. And Isaac had a son, Jacob. And Jacob had a son, Joseph. And that's where we're going to start. So Joseph was his dad's favorite, right? I mean, 
Joseph's dad loved him, and the other boys knew it, and that was an issue because he was the favorite. But Joseph was also just a little cocky and sometimes said things he shouldn't and probably made comments that he should have kept to himself, knowing that the other boys absolutely hated him. So one day he comes, being not very smart, and he's like, guys, I got to tell you this incredible dream that I just had. It's amazing. Like in this dream, your stuff was bowing to my stuff. And basically what God was saying is that one day I'll rule over you and you will all bow to me. I mean, really not a good thing to say to the brothers who already hate you. And they're like, that's it, that's it, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. We're done with this clown. Let's just kill him and get it over with and let's move on. And so they, they grab Joseph one day and they decide, okay, let's not kill him. So they throw him in this pit until they can decide what to do with him. And along comes this caravan of people who are traders. And these people go and they trade things. They're like, hey, hey man, listen, we, we got this awesome young guy, strong back, how about we sell him to you and you can take him with you to Egypt and sell him? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So they buy his brother and they're like, great, we're done. No more worries. So Joseph gets taken to Egypt and he starts serving in Egyptian homes and God's favor is upon Joseph everywhere he goes. Everything he does, God favors him. And the crazy thing is, it's not only that he favors him and he brings blessing to him, but he brings blessing to the home or to the area that he is working in. And so the people that had him loved him like, this guy is amazing. So long story short, one of the places he's serving, the wife loves him, really wants to love him. And and Joseph's like, no, I'm not into that. And so he gets thrown in jail. He gets set up. He gets put in jail. And while he's in jail, he meets some guys. And these guys are having dreams. And he interprets the dreams for them. And they're like, oh, dude, that's crazy. One's a great interpretation. One's a really bad outcome for the other guy. They both come true. And he said, hey, don't forget me. You know, make sure that they they understand I'm here and I'm really innocent, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, okay, that's great. We'll do that. And they forget him until one day when Pharaoh has this disturbing dream and none of his people can tell him what it means. And so the one guy goes, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Wait a minute. There's this dude in the the dungeon that can interpret dreams. He's like, really? He's like, yeah. He said, bring him up. So they bring him up and he comes and he's like, yeah, let me tell you what your dream means. He said, your dream basically means that, hey, For the next seven years, Egypt is going to have so much, so plentiful harvest and everything that it's not funny. And he's like, oh, that's awesome. He said, but the bad part is the next seven years is going to be an amazing and tragic famine. And here's what I think you have to do, Pharaoh. So here's the guy in the jail giving Pharaoh advice, right? He says, here's what I think you should do. He said, I think you should t- get somebody who's really smart, have them save tons of food in storehouses the first seven years. So the next seven years, that when all this comes together, he said, we're going to have plenty of food. And he said, oh, great idea. You're that man. So now all of a sudden, Joseph goes from being in prison to the second most powerful man in Egypt, only underneath Pharaoh. Pretty amazing. And so he does exactly what he said he should do. And so they store up all this food the first seven years. The next seven years, they have tons. They're doing great. People are coming from far away to get food because they have nothing. And so when they come, they see Joseph. So lo and behold, here come his brothers. And they're like, oh man, you know, we're coming here to to get food. And Joseph recognizes them. Now, if you're the second most powerful man in Egypt and these people are coming to get food from you and they're the ones who sold you into slavery, you spent time in prison for doing something you didn't do and spent most of your time away from your father and from your family, you have every ability to squash those people, don't you? Every ability. They didn't even know who Joseph was when they looked at him because he looked like an Egyptian, he talked like an Egyptian, and he walked like an Egyptian. (laughs) I can tell which one of you were in the 80s. (laughs) So anyhow, so Joseph does what he should do. He not only forgives them, he doesn't only forgive them, but he reconciles with them. And he invites them to all come. He brings his father, his whole family. They all come to Egypt and they all come and, and they stay in Egypt. And this is when it all begins. So now these people start having families and families and over this 440 years man the Israelites are booming okay so in Exodus 1 it says this Joseph had died 
The old Pharaoh had died. There's a new Pharaoh in place. And it says the new Pharaoh does not like that the Hebrews are growing so quickly. And in fact, he's getting a little frightened that they're going to overtake him and overthrow him because there's more of them almost than there are Egyptians. So he's like, okay, let's, let's just enslave them, put them to work for us. You know, it'll help us out a lot and it'll help control them. So they do that. But he still gets afraid because they're still multiplying. So the Pharaoh says, okay, every firstborn Hebrew son has to die. They're dead. Throw them in the Nile, they have to die. So you're you're talking about a lot, a lot of firstborn children who perish because of this. And this is his way because of his hate and because of his fear and his manipulation and being so narcissistic that he was gonna take care of all these fears that he had in his life. So he kills all these kids. So long story short, they start over all these years being in slavery. Can you imagine what that would be like that every new child who's born into a family is born into slavery and into hopelessness? Knowing that that child that you're gonna have in nine months is gonna become a slave with no other future other than to build things for the Egyptian kingdom. It almost makes you not want to have kids, right? But the joy of having a family overcame them, and they wanted that to happen. So all these kids were born into slavery. So as time went, there was one little Hebrew boy who was not thrown into the river, and his name was Moses. And Moses had been sat in a basket and scooted down the Nile, and the Pharaoh's daughter found him, took him into her home. So during this time... A little bit Hebrew boy was being raised as an Egyptian boy, and he was being raised in the court in the household of Pharaoh. He knew Pharaoh himself. He knew the family. Long story short, as he grew up in that family, one day he came upon an Egyptian taskmaster who was beating a Hebrew man, and he killed him, buried him, knew he had to take off, so he left. Years and years later, as he's tending sheep, God comes to him and says, Moses, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go back to Egypt and talk to Pharaoh because I want him to let my people go. They're crying out. They're praying to me. I I need to answer this prayer. He's like, whoa, you get the wrong guy. You know, I'm wanted back there and it was crazy what happened in my life. And he's like, no, I I really need you to do it. So long story short, Moses finally gives in and he goes back and he does what he's told to do. And he goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, listen, God says he wants his people back. You need to let him go. I know they're doing all this work for you, but sorry, it's not going to work out. And Pharaoh's like, nope, not going to happen. Now, I want you to see this in this story, because in this story with Pharaoh, God sends 10 plagues, okay? He sends 10 different plagues, and these plagues totally are starting to annihilate their economy and the system and their, their, their landscape, everything. It's really causing problems. But God is being gracious to Pharaoh. He's giving him total grace, going, Pharaoh, listen, man, just... Listen to what I'm telling you. Unharden your heart. Just let them go, and we don't have to walk through all these things. But Pharaoh just kept hardening his heart, and finally at a point, God hardened his heart. They went through nine plagues, and they were, they were horrific what they did to the Egyptian people. Guess what the tenth plague was? The firstborn son of every household would die unless they put the blood of a sacrificed lamb over the doorposts. And only, only the Israelites did that. So it's kind of like you killed all these Hebrew children and now all your Egyptian children are gonna die because you won't let my people go. Pharaoh, this is on you. And God gave him great grace and tried to bring him into relationship with him, but he wouldn't have it. So he didn't do what they said. All these children died. Finally, Pharaoh let them go. He said, get out of here. You know, you got to go. And they left, and he tried to chase them down. God crushed his army and let his children go on, and they followed him through the wilderness. Following God through the wilderness, not knowing what was going to happen from day to day, you know, and they would eat manna. You know, it means what is it? You know, and you've, you've tasted manna before. Remember the wafers we used to have when we were doing communion before we got the new ones? You kind of eat it, and you go, what is that? Kind of, the same, kind of the same thing. Not sure what it was, but it sufficed. But you know, the truth is, as they went and they followed God, it, it got hard. And in fact, they, they wanted to go back to slavery. They said, wasn't it easier for us to be slaves in Egypt? They were getting frustrated. 
So God stopped at Mount Sinai and, and Moses comes up and he goes up into the mountain and he talks with God for 40 days and 40 nights and he comes down with these 10 commandments. He's got these 10 commandments and he's saying, listen, this is for you. This is my guide. This is how we're gonna love one another. The path of freedom, all that God desires, all 613 laws that are in the Pentateuch, and the Pentateuch are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They have all those laws in there, 613 laws. were all summed up in these 10 commandments. And he said, in this, you will find how we're gonna work with each other. You're gonna find how we're gonna live together. And I want you to understand how you are to love other people. I want you to understand how you are to love me. So commandments one through four show us how to love God back and how to interact with him. The last six commandments show us how to love one another. And you know the two greatest commandments in the Bible, right? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And second is love your neighbor as yourself, right? So they're there, they're all in the 10 commandments right there, giving us a guideline of how we're supposed to do that. So when he wrote these 10 commandments, not only was it a guide, it was like a loving father saying to his children, look, I wanna build a place for you to have freedom and safety to operate in our relationship together. So how many people remember when you had your first child? If you have children, you had your first child, you know somebody had their first child, you know, and when they start crawling, all of a sudden the house is transformed, right? We have outlet plugs we're sticking in places, we have gates that we're putting up, we have pads that we're putting on, so if they hit their head on the table, it's just a pad, and it's a mild concussion instead of stitches, you know? So we, we try to safety-proof everything because we want them to have freedom within this space to be able to run around and do what they want to do and still not get in trouble, right? And as they get older, then we put fences around our yard sometimes because we want them to be able to have fun out there without running out into the street and getting hurt. And this is what God is doing as a father for us. He's like, look, these, these are not strict rules and regulations that you have to obey for morality's sake or to find my grace and to find relationship. He said, this, this is for your sake and our relationship's sake. When you stay within these things, you and I are gonna have an amazing time together and our relationship is gonna grow and it's gonna flourish and we're gonna move forward. So here's the problem. The lowercase g in each one of the commandments attacks our relationship with God. And the lowercase g in this first commandment that we're gonna talk about is exactly this. The lowercase God is the freedom to do whatever we want. That's a God in our life though sometimes, isn't it? Man, I, I can, I can, I'm American, I can choose and do what I want to. We're the land of the free, home of the brave, right? So I can choose and do whatever I want to. And God says, no, that, that is one of the lowercase g gods. When you think that you have total freedom without barriers, that becomes an issue. Because then you start doing things that aren't safe. You start walking outside of our relational barrier. And he said, that is not a safe place for you to be. I want you to stay within these confines because to stay within these confines will give you total freedom. So as God is looking back and he's seeing the Israelites, he sees that they do have total freedom without any guidelines. That's why he gives them the Ten Commandments. He says, we can't do this. So we're gonna get into the first commandment here. The number one commandment, and these go in order of importance, by the way, so if you don't get this one right, the rest of them aren't gonna fall into place. The number one commandment is you are to have no other gods besides me. And I'm not talking about beside me. I'm talking about beside me, you're to have no other gods. Nothing else in your life. Don't let those other things direct you. Don't let those other things take control of you. Don't let those other things corrupt you. But always understand that whatever you do, follow me only. So this was hard for the Israelites though. Because the Israelites had been in a land where there were tons of gods. The influence there, I mean there was a god for everything. The God of toilet paper, the God, you know, you name it, whatever, the sun God, the Nile River God, there were gods everywhere. And so they had been influenced greatly by the fact that if I don't like what this God's doing, then I can choose another God. 
Like if the God of fertility doesn't work for me, man, I'm going to the, the, the moon goddess. That's gonna be the next one that I follow. And God is saying, but there is no other God but me. I'm the only one. You're not even the God of your own life. I'm the God of your life. You think you're making decisions, but I am actually the God of your life. And it gets really dangerous when you start following other gods or you think that you're a God. And having another God to choose to follow is to choose to suffer. Because you're putting yourself in the hands of a God that doesn't even exist, doesn't have a relationship with you, doesn't have your well-being in mind. So when you looked in Egypt, there were a ton of gods, okay? But here's what happens. Freedom without boundaries, when you start following other gods, is slavery. In 2 Peter 3, 19, it says this. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption for whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. I want you to see that last line especially. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. So what you choose to follow, the consequences of that will enslave you. So if you're an alcoholic, the fact that you have chosen to to drink heavily, the consequences of that is you become addicted to alcohol, right? So now you're a slave to alcohol. And it's like that for everything. When, When wealth or something that you, you just, that's your God, I've gotta have, have, have constantly, spend, 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 have, 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 and I'm gonna keep working for that. The consequences of that is that that becomes your God and you become slave to that mentality to be able to pay for and to get and to have the things that you wanna have. So we have to be careful that freedom without boundaries is actually slavery, it's not freedom at all. And that's why he gave us the 10 commandments and said, here, follow these. So in Egypt, there was a lot of different gods, And some of these, Ashtoreth, Baal, Molech, and Chemosh, those were some of the the main guys that you've probably heard of. There's tons of other ones that you would say that we would never have even heard of. So we look at some of these guys and we think, wow, you know, those people were uncivilized. Yeah, they were just uncivilized. So, you know, I I don't think they really got it. You know, they they would have little images and things like that and really believed that, you know, this little wooden thing was going to answer a prayer for me, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that we're we're the same way. We're we're the exact same way. We may not have a a little wooden or a little golden thing sitting on our shelf, but we're the same way. We we still do the same thing with these gods. The problem is, is they've just rebranded some of the names. So Chemish, it could be Pleasure, the God of Pleasure. Baal, I mean, maybe it's the God of power, but we've just rebranded the names and now we still have become slave to these things. So many people will look at these different things and they'll say, oh yeah, man, I want fame and they'll do anything to have it. It's become your lower G God because it's coming before the true God. You spend more of your time there. And th- this day and age too, we see a lot of other things, not only money, pleasure, comfort, power, but we see things like education, I've seen people who have put their education before their relationship with God. Like their proverb says, you know, that knowledge puffs up. The more I know, the more important I become. And it becomes this God in your life. Social media has become a God in people's lives. They spend way more time on social media seeing what's happening in the world than they actually do in spending time with God. And then there's the God of selfies, right? Man, pick up somebody's phone. You'll see who they worship sometime. You know, there's 3,000 selfies on there. And sometimes we get caught up in this, not even realizing it. You know, the God of TikTok, you know, I love that. I hear that all over the place. I have three girls and, you know, I see people all the time on the streets doing the dances. I'll go by, I'll see somebody on the street doing a dance. Oh, TikTok, here you go. You know, so it becomes something like that. You know, I saw some of the most amazing worship And this sounds terrible, but I'm going to be honest with you. It was probably the most amazing worship I've ever seen in my life when I went to a Michael Jackson concert. And I I mean, I laugh too, but when you laugh, I'm being serious. I mean, people came. There was a group who had been saving their money from Japan because they wanted to come see Michael Jackson in concert. They'd been saving their money for two years so they could fly to this incredible place in the United States in California and sit in the front row of a Michael Jackson concert, hoping, just hoping, to be able to touch, reach out and touch Michael Jackson. And I saw, no lie, I saw people fainting, passing out at the front when Michael would touch them. 
and people screaming, wearing his, his glove and the outfits he would wear and red leather jackets. And I mean, it was a worship session. And we have to realize that things become God before the true and one and only God in our lives sometimes. And they may sneak in, you may not even realize it sometimes, that other things have been more important than the God who created us, the one who gave us freedom. And they start coming in and taking that place. And he's like, man, don't have any other gods before you. The question is, is why do we not live free when God has set us free? Why do we choose to be slaves to these lower G gods? One of the reasons is fear of the unknown. I mean, it's just like the Israelites. When they were going through the wilderness, I mean, they didn't know what was coming tomorrow. They were just following. They were supposed to be going to the promised land. They didn't know what the, the plan was. And my wife always says, if, if I just know what the plan is, I feel a lot more comfortable. And we're all like that, right? We all want to know what tomorrow holds. We all want to know what, what's going on. But sometimes the fear of the unknown, when he says, pick up your cross and follow me, what does that mean? Where am I going? What do you expect of me? And we don't always have that plan. Sometimes it's that relational thing. Why? I just trust you. Have anybody done one of those trust falls? You know, where like, just fall back and I'm going to catch you. And I saw them on YouTube. My kids were showing me trust falls that went wrong. And that's why people, you know, it's the fear of the unknown. Are you really going to catch me? And we're like that with God sometimes. The next is that I have habits that I won't or I don't want to give up. I mean, think about this in your life. Do you have habits in your life that you know, that you know that are probably keeping you from God? Like there's these things that you do that they push you away from your relationship in God. If you're really honest, I've got habits in my life that I'm like, I need to stop doing that because I could spend my time a lot more wisely and I could build my relationship with God, do the things that God has asked me to do if I would just put that time aside. And they, they kind of consume it and I don't live free because of that. And then I like this one. My life is really not that bad. Slavery isn't really that bad. It's what I know. Have you heard people like that? And I've counseled people like that. I've heard the, the lady who would sit there and say, you know, yes, my husband physically and emotionally abuses me, but I, I just can't leave. Why? Because it's really not that bad. It's what I know. I'm comfortable with that. I, I know what to expect every night when he comes home. You know, I'm, I've always said, man, I, I hate to hear this. I heard a lady tell me one time, she said, but he's, he's only hit me once. And he said he was sorry. And he cried and it won't happen again. And I said, if anybody ever hits one of my girls once, it'll be the last time. It's not gonna happen. But they continue to fall into this because we think it's really not that bad. You know, slavery is okay. And that's what the Israelites said. We should go back to Egypt. It's a lot easier. We know what to expect. Then the last one is the lie that I cannot really change. How many people have heard that before? Man, this is who I am. I am who I am. I just can't change. It's the way God created me, you know. That is not the way that God created you. God did not create you to be enslaved to these lowercase g gods. He did not create you to not have freedom within Christ. He did not create you to be a failure. He did not create you to be far from him. He did not create you to walk a life in a path of sin and hopelessness. That is not how God created us, not at all. So when we think about this, is there a lowercase g God that is standing in the way of you loving the one true God the way that you should? That's the question I want you to walk away with today. Is there a lowercase g God in your life that's standing in the way of you worshiping the one true God the way that you should? I want you to hear this today. God created you for freedom in Jesus Christ. That's what he created you for. He did not create you to be a slave to sin. He created you to be free to follow him and to have a relationship with him. Jesus gave his life so that our sin would be paid for, that we could be forgiven and we could be reconciled with the Father. 
That's what he created us for. That's the freedom that we have within these 10 commandments. So today, I don't know, maybe there is a lowercase g God that's in your way. And I'm telling you right now that God wants you to walk away from that. God is telling those masters in your life right now, let my people go. Let my people go. And I don't know what it is that maybe in your life, maybe you've already found freedom in Christ, but you've gone back to slavery and some things. But Jesus wants to free you from that. God wants to free you from that. Maybe you haven't even had freedom the first time. You don't know what it means to have freedom in Christ. But we want you to know, in all of our campuses and online today, that there are people who are waiting to pray with you at the end of the service, talk to you a little bit. But what does it mean to have freedom in Christ? What does it mean to be free from these habits and these things that enslave me, that I feel like I'm not moving forward in my life, that my life is just being wasted, and I'm spinning my wheels, I'm stuck in the mud, and I can't move forward? God is calling you to come to freedom today. There's a verse in Galatians 5, 1, and it says this, for freedom has set us free. Freedom has set us free. So stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So once you've been freed and Jesus is saying, do not go back to what you went back to. Don't go back to Egypt. There's nothing but death and sorrow in that place. When I have given you freedom, live it out in the way I've asked you to within these boundaries that our relationship can be full and whole. And if you wanna find that freedom today, we wanna to show you what that means. And if you're struggling because you went back to slavery, we wanna help you step back out of that. So as we pray today, I want you to consider this, that if those are you, those are the things you're struggling with, then I want you to make sure that today, before you leave this building, before you get offline, that you stop and you pray and you talk to someone, that you can find the life of freedom that God has called you to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have done so much for us. And Father, sometimes we in turn, we in turn just turn our backs on you. God, you have shown us freedom through your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we don't wanna walk back into the, to slavery again. We wanna be free, we wanna grow, we wanna flourish in our relationship with you. So Father, we ask you that you would give us the courage to keep stepping forward into the unknown, even though we, we don't have control of it and we're trusting you, that we would trust you. And as you take us, Lord, into freedom, as you take us into new places in our life. Father, as you lead us to become people that you've created us to be, Father, let us have the courage to say yes. God, if there are people out here today who are struggling and they don't know you and they're still lost in the slavery that sin puts us in, God, I pray that you would give them the courage to step forward today and to say yes to you, to find that freedom in Christ. God, help us to be people who not only live freedom, but Lord, that is what comes out of us, that people see a different life in this and they ask, what is it that's going on in your life? What is it that you have? Who is it that you're following? And God, let us be your witnesses in this world. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you that even when we fail to obey, you keep coming back over and over and over, full of grace, full of love, and full of mercy in our lives. Father, we love you. Thank you for not only your son, Jesus, but thank you for the freedom that you have given us to choose to follow you and to live a life that is full. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer team would love to pray with you today and share your needs and bring them before the Lord. So please use the chat function on whatever device you're looking at right now or call the church. Let us know how we can pray with you. And thank you so much for remembering to honor God with your giving during this time as we head into the summer season. Thank you for your faithfulness. And now receive the benediction. May the love of God the Father the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you.